Welcome to Total Health Magazine on Total Health Television. I'm your host, John Barson. Today we're going to talk about a subject that, well, I would think most people take for granted, and that's breathing. Uh, in particular, we are going to focus on how you can learn how to breathe properly to reduce the impact of viruses uh, on your immune system. And we're going to explain why um, and how you can do that with uh, Professor Eric Pepper of San Francisco University, who is also the president of the Biofeedback Federation of Europe and maintains a private practice in the city of San Francisco. Let's bring him in right now. Hello, Hello Professor. Hello. Hello, Thank John. You for, thank you for taking the time. You know, uh, Professor Carmen uh, Rossinello sent me a link to your blog the other day, and I started reading those articles, not just on the COVID-19, but the, the, the depth of the research that you've done over the years um, on breathing, on asthma, and on different chronic conditions. And, and I have to tell you, uh, my, my scalp kind of lit up a little. <laughs> um, as I had a very life-changing experience back in the late 90s when I was uh, building a tech company and doing my broadcasting, and I was so stressed out and my asthma was getting worse and worse and worse to the point where I was actually having to make uh, emergency runs to the hospital for life-saving asthma treatments. And uh, thank heavens, if you get into a hospital emergency room and you, you have an asthma attack, you actually get to go to the front of the line. So <laughs> they don't sit you down there for a couple of hours waiting for a doctor. Um, but the other thing is, I, I had inhalers everywhere. I had one in my car, I had one in my office, I had one in the bedroom, one in the kitchen. I just had them everywhere. And then my, uh, my MD uh, put me on prednisone. And I thought, okay, you know, this is gonna help. And I thought, okay, great. But I also like to ask questions. So I did some research into prednisone and I thought, holy crap, the doctor's gonna kill me if I go on this stuff for too long. So I started asking questions. I, I hooked up with a naturopath, a functional medicine doctor. And I can't remember the exact time frame, but let's say within two years or so, I was off all inhalers no more asthma attacks. I changed my diet. I changed, I learned how to breathe properly. So when I read your blog, I got very excited. I thought I've, we've got to get you on the program. We've got to share some of your knowledge uh, with our viewers because I'm sure I'm not the only one and everybody is concerned about COVID-19. So um, let's, let's, let's go back a little bit first and give, give our viewers a bit of a background on, on your history. Well, I started the area of breathing probably in the 1980s, hard to believe, as a researcher, but also just as an interest because I was intrigued to work, to work with students and clients. And what seemed clear is that breathing is so automatic, we're totally unaware of it till it's dysfunctional, till I either wheeze, till I can't inhale. And the most common problem people experience was always I can't inhale. And then if you step outside of more traditional psychology or, or medical recordings where they would look either at the rate of breathing, they would look at how much you know, volume you inhale or the airways constriction. If you step outside of that, you realize, wait a minute, breathing is much more than that. It is basically where you breathe, how fast you breathe, at which rate. So I can breathe high up in my chest. I can breathe very low in my stomach. And all these different breathing patterns may have an impact in our body. And we have underestimated the power and the effect of that. The, one of the most well-known phenomena has been the carbon dioxide we exhale, but also the dissolved carbon dioxide in our body. That's often called, if we breathe too quickly, called hyperventilation. And so I got intrigued in that phenomenon. Not hyperventilating where you go, <sighs> nothing like this, but a kind of almost subclinical ventilation, which was a kind of British model by Lum and others. And then we observed by just changing breathing patterns a tiny bit, you can induce anxiety for many people. You can have other qualities. And out of this came interested, what is optimum breathing or what is functional breathing with the least amount of effort? And now if you look at people, look at a little baby who is really happy and healthy. And what you see is a baby whose stomach really moves in and out. The sides of the lower ribs move in and out. The chest doesn't really move very much. It's most interesting. 
It's as if the body looks like an egg and the bottom part expands and goes in. And that is an easy breathing pattern. And when you study people who are at peace, who have very functional breathing, what you see is they inhale, they exhale. There's almost a pause for three or four or five seconds. And then there's the feeling of inhaling again and you inhale one more time. And you keep doing it that way. And it's like that pause at the end. And so I get intrigued at looking at people, how can we teach them more optimum breathing, just like your story you told about yourself. So then the well, first I, thing when you work. Sorry, I was just gonna say uh, what you're talking about, the, because if you try to breathe up here in your upper chest, right? You've got a rib cage here. So your chest really can't expand. Your lungs can't really expand. So if you're breathing lower, like you said, the stomach on a baby, I mean, they haven't, they haven't taught themselves how to breathe incorrectly. They're breathing the way nature intended. <laughs> so it's, it's when they get older, they, they forget that, oh wait, I should be breathing like this. Uh, because it's not something we think of a lot, but there are so many benefits to that, right? There's the, you improve the blood brain flow, you improve, uh, you boost your immune system. Uh, there just benefit after benefit after benefit. It's even more subtle than that, or even more important than that. If you think about it, the baby again, like you said, it's the abdomen that expands. There's this big muscle, if I can stand, called the diaphragm that runs right here. And so when I inhale, it goes down. And when I exhale, my abdomen this whole area comes in, pushing this diaphragm up. But what that does, which is most interesting for people, is that it isn't only breathing, not only affects our air intake and our oxygen transport or carbon dioxide, it also is the pump by which our GI system is the, the lymph and venous return is, is uh, moved in a sense or pumped back up. And if you do not have abdominal movement, I can almost always predict or say, you probably have GI distress or pain in that area, et cetera. When you learn to allow this breathing to go there again, at least you're supporting your own health. I think that was the major part. And so now when we looked at people who had asthma, for example, Many of them, they would report, I can't get more air in. But they never right. really exhaled or they did incomplete exhalation or they only held their stomach in and it's like they were breathing almost in a reverse way. They were trying awful hard. They lifted their chest up and pulled it. They sucked in their stomach at the same time. The kind of pattern of fear. When the person is totally relaxed, it's the opposite. Let me give people an experience how quickly breathing can affect you, if that's okay. So what I'd like you to do is just sit normally and then you inhale, just inhale. And now when you exhale, exhale about 60% of the previous inhaled air. So you inhale, you exhale about 60%, then you inhale again, you exhale about 60%. Keep doing that for a moment or two and just do this. So you inhale, Exhale a little bit of air, don't exhale at all. Inhale again, exhale a little bit, don't exhale at all. Inhale again, exhale again a little bit. Keep doing it. Do it for 30 seconds. And what you then find, that's our early published studies, that the majority of people will notice an increase in anxiety. And if you felt that, they feel essentially a fuzziness in their head some even get pain, chest pain. And yet on the outside, just like I'm looking at you, John, I never even noticed, noticed you're breathing that way. In 30 seconds, you can have major changes. Wow, I just, yeah, I just, I'm like, whew, I have to breathe properly. And then you don't look any different. Once, we, once you see that, you realize breathing has much more power. So then the question really becomes, how can you optimize the breathing? And I'll just give basically a couple of simple hints but people can do. Great. One, it's critical, if possible, to breathe through your nose. Because what does the nose do? The nose takes the air from the outside, it filters it, it warms it, and it slows down the flow, so it causes less irritation in the airways. While the air is flowing through the nose, 
the mucosa produces more nitric oxide, which almost acts like a sterilizer inside, and will also allow better oxygen transport across the, in the alveoli. When you exhale, you want to do the same thing. Exhale through your nose, let the air flow out very slowly, evenly. Obviously, if you're jogging, or then you're going to breathe much more quickly. So it depends on the task you're doing. But if you're sitting here, even put your hand on your stomach, and as you inhale, let the stomach area get bigger. Think that your lungs are not located in your chest, which are encased by the ribs, but really imagine it like a balloon in your stomach. It's hard to think that way, and yet it's critical to see it that way, like the baby. Breathe like the baby. Inhale. But before you can inhale, that's what most people forget. You need to exhale. So when you exhale, let your stomach come in. And I make a sound like that because sometimes it's a bit easier in the beginning to do that if you exhale through a little fricative. However, you really want to do it through your nose the whole time. So that's but like many uh, people. Well, sorry, when I watch uh, uh, when in, in the old days, in the olden days, they had this uh, event called uh, Wimbledon and uh, the U.S. Open. <laughs> and uh, boy, some of those tennis players, it's. Uh, I love, especially the women, they just, they, they, when they're breathing and they, they come in, they hit, there's like, whew, they have that little, or like when I took karate when I was a kid, whew, whew, and all that, you know, that, that, whew, whew, um, that, all of those different breathing techniques. Yes, and what you just did, I'll let, I'll let me explain in one more moment about the breathing and then about the sports. So in the sports, what you really do is, and that's for anybody who has pain, by the way, if you do the movement as you, when you start exhaling, the pain will tend to be much less and you'll even be more flexible and have more power. So if I stood up at this moment, the normal tendency may be to brace and then I stand up. If I do the inverse, I breathe, I inhale. And now as I start exhaling, so now I start exhaling. I'm using a sound that should be through my nose. And then as I exhale, I stand up then I find my pain and discomfort is significantly less. Now going back to the slower breathing, the abdominal breathing. Many people find they, there's no movement in their abdomen. And there are a couple of reasons for this. One, if I'm scared, think of it from an early evolutionary perspective. There's a saber-toothed tiger over there. It's going to attack me. I'm protecting myself, holding my stomach tight. Well, if my stomach is tight, the only way I can breathe is to go, and I've just activated my sympathetic arousal. And if I do that long enough, I eventually make myself, my immune system less competent. Because when I give these flight fight responses, why should my body digest food? Why should my body restore itself when it's becoming someone else's lunch? So in that very <laughs> simplistic way. Somebody else's the other reason like people, <laughs> yes, the other reason people don't tend to breathe in their abdomen is, I'll call it designer's gene syndrome. We wear the corset, we wear clothing, a belt, we wear Spanx, whatever it may be, and we do that for self-image. But it's really a corset, and that means that my abdomen cannot expand. I have to breathe in my chest more. I tend to breathe more quickly. I get more neck and shoulder tension often and may have many other disorders. And in fact, in the 19th, the turn of the century, there was a whole category of illnesses for women. These were the women who all wore the corsets. And if you even go to San Francisco today, you have these lovely Victorian buildings. The first room on top of the stairs is called the fainting room. Because the people used to walk, if the corset walk up the stairs, they'd be going, <laughs> and they would faint. There are two or three more other reasons why we don't breathe in our abdomen. Any kind of surgery or assault to the abdomen. What we have learned is that once we've had surgery or pain, we learn to protect ourselves and we don't move and we don't unlearn it. So what I see, at least in with many of the clients or students or others, those that have abdominal surgery, is a cesarean, 
with others. They've healed. No one taught them again to reestablish healthy breathing. So now they move into a dysfunctional state. So you, now, how you could actually, all... sorry, you, you could actually change, um, like we're talking about, or they're talking about, the media is talking about how this, we're making societal changes. Like we're changing the nor the norms have, are changed. They're they're not norms now. They're changes. Uh, no handshaking. No, uh, you know, less than six feet. We're going to get into that in a minute before we run out of time because we have, I definitely want to talk about the COVID nineteen and, and viral load. Correct. Um, but uh, what you're saying is everybody should be able to instead of wearing tight suits and you know the tight tie and the tight suit and the women in the tight dresses and the and even the guys wearing girdles, um, you got to think about your whole health. And maybe now is the time to do that. In this time when we're starting to make changes, um, let's have that serious conversation about what we're doing to ourselves as a society and that image that we see in Hollywood where you got to look like this, you got to be skinny, you got to be tight, you got to have, you got to have all that. And we should really all be walking around in jogging pants or, um, John, John Krasinski, uh, John Krasinski, oh, he's going to laugh at that one. John Krasinski's uh, tutu in his last weekly <laughs> program <laughs> when he stood up and he had a big tutu on it. It just cracked me up. That guy's great. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's, it, this is what we need to talk about. So let's talk about COVID-19 because when I looked at your blog and I saw those images and we're going to bring them up as we talk here. Um, and I saw the image of the, of the guy breathing when I saw... Uh, the image of the teens vaping. When I saw all of this and 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 your explanation of how to breathe, um, I thought we've got to share this with our viewers and our readers. So let's let's go there. Let's talk about that. Great. So, you, so one thing to remember generally is when you're exhaling, you're exhaling without knowing. When I'm talking, I'm both projecting out the little particles, etc. They travel a certain distance, and all of us know that indirectly. When you're walking down the street and someone is smoking, you can smell the smoke before you ever get near them, depending on the breeze. Now, you could half imagine that the smoke you smell could be the viral particles. That's the basic logic of it. So we are always sh shedding viral particles if we are infected. The trouble in the United States and around the world is that anyone who gets infected by COVID by the coronavirus, for the first four or five days, they most likely do not have any symptoms, zero. Only on day four or five, it obviously depends per person, but generally the first four days of the infection, they don't have symptoms, and yet they are already shedding the viral particles and potentially affecting anybody else. Once you see that, then you realize, unless we test people their antibodies that they have had the illness or do not have uh, the coronavirus, you have to assume that everybody around you is contagious. That means you need to be far enough away from the person. That's the whole part of social distancing, a term I really dislike. It is really physical distancing and social connectiveness or improving that. But then you need physical distancing. And what people forget in physical distancing, there are two components that it, it, it depends. Uh, let me, what people forget in physical distancing that it depends on the airflow around you. So if there's a breeze, I can be talking to you. If the breeze is behind me and you are downwind, then, then six feet may not be far enough because the wind is carrying these particles right into you like a plume. On the other hand, if the wind is diagonal or you know, perpendicular to us, I can almost be close to you. And all the particles that I'm emitting this way are just swept to the side by the wind that way. This is even more important in sports when you're bicycling or running. Well, wait, because wait, I'm wait, oh, oh, actually, wait a second. Before you go into that, uh, when you're talking about that, all I can think of now is because we just got a post from our, our local... Um, health people saying that, uh, that there are areas where they're they're changing the way the, changing people flow, and they're saying okay, so they're going to open up these trails, but you can only walk one way. So what you're saying is just because you're walking one way doesn't mean you're protecting yourself. 
now you have to be aware of the wind flow, um, how close you are to that person because you're breathing their air that they're expelling as they're walking forward and you're coming up behind them. Absolutely. Let's say if there's absolutely no wind for a moment and I'm walking or standing still, six feet is a great distance unless I'm really coughing and projecting more. If I wear a personal mask, remember, this is going to contain any virus I could be emitting. So the only thing that mask really does, the major purpose of a mask is not to protect you from others. It's to protect others potentially from being infected by you. And since you don't know if you are infected or not for the first four days, if you get infected, you are, I have to assume everybody is contagious unless they have a, a symbol on their shirt that says, I have the antibodies <laughs> right. in that sense. You know. uh, now this becomes critical if I now walk, when I walk and then the I, I exhale, but this exhalation as I walk forward, this cloud moves behind me in a kind of slipstream. And if I walk fairly fast, that slipstream may be up to 20 feet in jogging even. If I'm cycling, and every cyclist knows this, in cycling, you're going to try to be, be, you want to be behind the cyclist in front of you in their slipstream so you have less wind resistance. But that slipstream contains all the viral particles the person is exhaling potentially. In cycling, the, the Belgium simulation study from the Belgium and the Netherlands shows it can last, it's, the distance is up to 60 feet, that slipstream. It's really interesting to look at that. Now, this all leads to another part. So one, when you're walking, be somewhat aware of the breeze. I now always walk upwind. Yeah, <laughs> Everybody idea. can be downwind. From me. I mean, I'm aware of that because I do sailing. I have done sailing, so I'm almost, I don't have to think about it. But, you know, most people are, they're often unaware of that. But what you're really, there's a whole other part of all this, and I'm going to talk about that. I think that would be critical. And that is the viral load yes or the density okay so let me go back in how, the importance of that and what to do and the, and ways to potentially reduce infection among family members and others and how to stay healthier so there are two concepts one how can i reduce the inhalation of the viral load that's one and two how can i reduce the air around me, so it's fresh air. In historical records, going right, going all, uh, going back to 1918, much earlier, with viral infections and bacterial infections and tuberculosis, it makes no difference. The data is overwhelming. That if you allow a lot of fresh air to go through the area, the co the infection rate by others is much less. And sometimes, if you are infected, you have better recovery. Let me explain this. Let me do it an example for those who are much older before children were vaccinated. When children pre-vaccination time would be playing in the playground and a child had a childhood illness, a viral illness, and another child was playing with it, that child would, that child would then probably infect the other children. But the, the rate of infection or they, let's say, they infect the other children. However, if you think of that infection, the child was there momentarily outside. It took a very small dose of the viral particles in. It didn't know that. And then it didn't take any more in. Now the child went home. The, vir the viral particles infected the, the whole nasal cavity and all the, the upper respiratory tract. But the, the initially there were very few viruses multiplying. So the body had time to develop its own immunity and antigens. And then as the child emitted these viruses, it would then spread them around. And if the room was closed off, it would re-inhale these same particles, again, infecting itself more. But however, the child had time. So usually these children had a very light case of the, the disease. However, their brothers and sisters got very seriously sick. Now, why would they get seriously sick? Well, because they'd be sleeping in the same bedroom or in the same living room or wherever they were, 
And now the sick child be emitting or shedding the virus, not just for a short moment, continuously. So their brothers and sisters were massively infected with a high dosage of virus over a long time period. And when that hit the, those, their brothers and sisters, then their immune system was trying to ramp up, but was initially way overwhelmed. Once you once sees this concept, you want to apply it to your own world. Okay, okay, so what you're saying makes so much sense from an intellectual perspective, from an intuitive perspective, uh, from a science perspective, it makes so much sense. And yet, all you see on the media, like now I read yesterday, um, they're trying to, they think maybe Iceland will be the place that figures out why some people get slightly ill and some people get more seriously ill and some people get really ill. And you've just explained it. And you're right. That's the whole concept behind a vaccine, right? You, you, you inject well, a small amount and your body builds the antibodies to combat it. That makes, that makes so much sense. Yeah, you have to remember it's, life is more complex. You have both the viral load, which is the one we can have control over by changing the air. But then you have your own immune system. And your own immune system, depending how competent it is, has a factor. So if you have an incompetent immune system, even a smaller viral load will make you much sicker. Right. So it's that kind of ratio. So keep that in mind. It's a number, a number, a number, of, a number of factors, of course. Yeah, it wasn't I know. <laughs> but it was all that one thing. But um, again, that was when I read that in your in your blog. I was like, oh my gosh, I got to talk to this guy. <laughs> Somebody that knows what's yeah, going what's on. Yeah, interesting is there's nothing new about this. No. You know, people have demonstrated that if many years ago with tuberculosis, did you get an 82% reduction of, it, of infections of others if you opened up all the windows and doors? Right. And so, but, and now you can see why the flu is so much worse in the winter usually than in the summer, because in the winter, especially in, North, in, in the US and anywhere, we, live, we close the windows, we are trying to heat the house. So we're recycling the old air and the viral particles. And so do what my mother used to say, you know, you must have sunlight and fresh air. So I recommend always get a cross breeze through the house. Now that's difficult in the winter because now your bedroom will be colder. But I remember sleeping with these frost flowers on the window. Yes. <laughs> you know, but that's for health, that may be much better than closing the windows. Now remember, in many people who live in apartment buildings or work in buildings which are sealed, you are recycling the old air. So what can you do in those cases? One, I would automatically in my space put, get a HEPA filter. These are these filters which really can part, pull out all the smallest particulates. So at least the recycled air coming out of this filter will be better. Two, if, you're, if you are sick at home, or think you could be sick, then be sure there's a cross breeze through your house so it goes out the window where the sick person is. If that's not easily possible, because many apartment buildings do not have cross flow, they may only have windows on one side, put a fan in the window which will suck out the air out of your apartment so then the air keeps flowing from the rest of the apartment from other windows through the bedroom where the person may be sick or potentially sick and go out. I think that is the simple mechanical ways of thinking about it. And then finally, what can you do if you're near a sick person or passing somebody who often is too close to you? Remember, you want to reduce your viral exposure. Think of that. And we learned this from the work with people, when we did the work with people with asthma. So what you do? I'm approaching a person, they could be emitting it. I can't be six feet away. So before I see them, I take a lower breath slowly. And then as I pass them, I let air out a little bit. I hold it till I pass them way further. I keep exhaling through my nose and then I inhale again fresh air. I do the same thing if I may be startled, like in the supermarket, somebody always comes up to me at that moment the normal impulse is to almost gasp. When you do that, you're taking the air, the particles in, do the opposite. At that moment, stop breathing, practice exhaling 
slightly through your nose, wait till the person has passed, and then inhale again. I think that's both simple. What we forget, however, is this kind of training takes role rehearsal. You have to practice it. It seems so simple when we worked with people who had, who had asthma, we practiced for 16 weeks doing it. You know, so in your family, make a noise. The moment a loud noise goes on, hold your breath, shh, exhale slightly. It's useful. I hope these tips can be helpful. Well, I've been practicing it for three days. <laughs> so, <laughs> Great. Yeah, no, and I love it. And how does it feel? Great. Well, it's, it, it's actually good. It feels good. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I've always known the importance of breathing and deep breathing and breathing properly, you know, from my cycling and my asthma and all, all of my own life experiences. But uh, it, it's one thing for me to talk to people about it. It's a complete other thing to have you, the expert on explaining why it's important. So, um, because my wife, you know, she'll say to me, like, well, you're not a doctor. I'm like, okay, all right, well, let's, uh, let's get a doctor on then. <laughs> so it's, it's just, it, it, look, it's been great. Um, we, ha we have to wrap this up, but uh, Professor Pepper, I hope you will come back. It is my pleasure, and I hope that the concepts and the people at least remember, you can take control. It doesn't mean it will be perfect, but it's important to take charge because when you take charge, you do, you take charge of the things you have control over. And that itself, that sense of empowerment will, in, will tend to increase your immune system a tiny bit versus being hopeless. Well, as I look at the world, I say, you know, when the world gives me lemons, make lemonade. Right. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> I'm going to go Thank make some so lemonade. <laughs> Although I was uh, watching, uh, you know, I'm, I'm part of that, that, that cult, uh, watching Netflix. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was watching, uh, I just started watching uh, Oz Ozark and uh, my friend's like, you've uh -huh. got to watch Ozark if you haven't seen it. And uh, they're, 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 <laughs> you say make lemonade. And, and I just watched that episode last night. So <laughs> when the wife says, I'm going to go make some lemonade, what she really means is I'm, we're going to kill this guy, right? <laughs> so. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, John, as I think of all this, and I think of breathing, you know, we have a kind of implicit cultural wisdom how important breathing is. Yes. Think of all the linguistic phrases we have. You know, I'm waiting with bated breath for this interview. I have a sigh of relief and it's all over. You know, he's full of hot air. He's inspired. You know, you can keep going. They reflect patterns of breathing that reflect health. It reflects emotions. It affects spirit. All right. Well, we're going to do our best to send every single viewer and reader to your blog so they can actually get all of the information and all of the science. Um, I was really, really, really encouraged to read. Uh, I went through most of your studies that are on your blog and uh, there's just so much information there. So we've got all the links below. Uh, please, viewers, uh, take some time. Uh, especially and share the blog, share the professor's blog, especially that blog on, on the proper breathing. All right. So, uh, Professor Pepper, thank you very much for being with us today. John, it's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. All right. We'll have you back. So that's it for this edition of Total Health Magazine. Remember, learn how to breathe properly and stay healthy.